What's happening, movie freaks? James Hancock here. We're going all out for you today with a deep dive into some of the movies which, in my mind, define the great city of New York. For cinephiles, New York is like a giant, living, breathing museum of historic movie locations. And earlier this year, with the help of my friend Bill Scurry, we decided to celebrate these landmarks, starting with a very special location in Dumbo that will forever be associated with the great Sergio Leone. In 1984, Once Upon a Time in America, I think it's one of those movies that is a neglected classic. Sergio Leone, one of the all-time great filmmakers, known for spaghetti westerns, but when it comes to grand opera, visual storytelling, no one better. But because this movie got absolutely butchered and mangled and released in broken form, I think it's taken decades for this movie to achieve its rightful place in the pantheon of all-time great gangster movies. But I think it deserves to be mentioned alongside Godfather, any gangster film you care to mention. But just the fact that the great Sergio Leone was here in New York 35 years ago, it makes this hallowed ground for film lovers as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, no, I think the point of getting a shot like this is that this piece of New York had managed to hang on a lot longer than a lot of other pieces of New York in terms of uh, contemporizing, which is why they picked their angles very carefully. You know, they have, they're, they're on the corner of uh, Washington and Water Street there in Dumbo. And the rest of the movie was shot in a combination of the Lower East Side and Williamsburg. They look really close to the 1923. You're talking about nearly 50 years of New York unchanged. Um, and it was really hard to find corners of New York that were tucked in from modernity like that. After shamelessly geeking out, imagining ourselves walking in the footsteps of Sergio Leone, we turned our eyes west. We crossed the East River by ferry and found ourselves at the South Street Seaport, the location of quite a different movie entirely. New York might be known for its gangster epics, but it's equally famous for its love stories. And with this film, Peter Bogdanovich gave us one of the best movies about New York and falling in love ever made. They all laughed. Long before he was directing movies, Bogdanovich got a start as a film programmer at the Museum of Modern Art here in the city, eventually becoming one of our greatest film historians. It is an honor to celebrate his work here in this video. Five minutes, Angel. I'll bet. Five minutes. Hey! Arthur! Ah! Shit! So this is definitely one of the more one of the more obscure movies we'll be talking about today. But 1981, they all laugh. From director Peter Bogdanovich. Everybody talks about Last Picture Show. People talk about Paper Moon. They talk about uh, What's Up Doc. I think his masterpiece is They All Laughed. And of all the movies about New York, most movies depict New York as this tough, just hard, like kind of hard knuckle town, where filled with these really ruthless people. This is a movie about the nicest, coolest, most lovely people you'll ever meet. And they do nothing but all day but have adventures, hang out with other cool people, and fall in love. I feel like it's probably the most optimistic movie about New York ever made, about the, just the wondrous possibilities of life. Obviously, making it far more tragic is this horrible, tragic story about Dorothy Stratton and what happened immediately thereafter. But when it comes to movies where you just want to hang out with the characters, as Quentin Tarantino describes them, the great hangout movies, Rio Bravo or Daisy Confused, they all laughed. It's one of the all-time great hangout movies. Yeah, it's unusual. The contrast uh, from a lot of movies that did choose New York to shoot in like 1980, 1981, that was sort of peak uh, crumbling New York infrastructure, the whole, uh, you know, Ford to uh, New York drop dead, that kind of thing. And this movie is so light and buoyant. I mean, compare it, one of my other favorite movies is Eyes of Laura Mars, which is just so dark and grotty, and it uses that New York as a backdrop for murder and suspicion. And that's what you tend to see. That, I mean, I love New York on film between 1980 and 1981. It's one of my favorite periods, just for the way the city looked. It was on the, you know, the cusp of coming out of the 60s and 70s. Like Prince of the City. And then you're into the 80s, exactly. And the weird thing, you know, Bogdanovich, who is a New York native, but he spent so much time in Los Angeles, it's like he became a Californian. Um, so I think this is the first time he actually shot New York, or at least for all, that, for all intents and purposes, this is where it counts. So for him, it was a bit of a homecoming, too, a love letter to New York. Um, the same way like Woody Allen was doing Manhattan and stuff like that. He really wanted to show you the beauty of the city the way that he saw it. So when you look at the cast in this, John Ritter, never better. Ben Gazzara, never better. But it's all so effortless. It seems like they're just having so much fun. It's just it's as natural as breathing, and it just, it'll charm its way right up your leg. And I, there's not, I think it stands alone. It's an utterly unique movie in so many ways. And I don't even listen to country music. I'm going to start because of this movie. This building actually is the Odyssey Detective Agency where you have just 
the coolest cats in history all hanging out, you know, giving each other like secret hand signals about like, you know, you're gonna need a beard, et cetera. And they had this as a great like unspoken chemistry. You shaved today, Charlie? What? Yes. Funny, from here looks like you got a beard. A beard? Nope, smooth as silk. I really feel like kind of presumptuous talking about the history of this movie because there is a guy out there who knows more about this movie than anybody. He made this movie called uh, One Day Since Yesterday. His name's Bill Tech, but by strange coincidence, he happens to be right over here directing this movie. Don't look at the camera. Just keep, keep talking. Just keep talking. Don't look at the camera. But if you want to get a deep dive on this film, One Day Since Yesterday, that is your money shot. Check it out. We smell of success. So enough about love already. Time to wallow in the darkness again with our trip up to 52nd Street in Midtown. If your vision of New York is of smoke and shrouded nightclubs filled with hard drinking, ruthless, powerful people who are plotting and scheming to destroy each other, there's really no substitute for Sweet Smell Success. With a savage screenplay by Clifford Odets and Ernest Lehman, this might be the toughest movie ever written about the city of New York. 21 Club, like piece of New York it. history. The cool people just call it 21. But in the 1950s, this area on 52nd Street between 5th and 6th was the heart of New York's jazz scene. Whether it's Dizzy Gillespie or Charlie Parker, you kind of died by the time this movie got made. But 1957, sweet smell of success. And when it comes to just venomous, evil, charming, hysterical, thrilling movies about horrible, ambitious people, sweet smell of success is kind of the undisputed goat, just the greatest of all time on that front. You've got Burt Lancaster as J.J. Hunsecker. You've got Tony Curtis as Sidney Falco, his, basically his subservient who hates himself for it but wants to be Burt Lancaster one day, but probably the best scene in the movie takes place right inside here, shot on a soundstage elsewhere, but as they come out, Burt Lancaster just walks out into the street like he owns the entire island of Manhattan. And they're just like swaggering up and down the street, talking to corrupt cops. He's just, he's got his fingers in a lot of pies, but I see when it comes to the musicality and just the aggression of great writing, Sweet Smell Success might be the best screenplay ever written. And something like 21. Now, we don't have this anymore either. A restaurant or a club that winds up having this atmosphere of you want to be inside of it. And there's a gatekeeper keeping you outside. I mean, there's nightclubs. I mean, Hunsucker even tells the waiter, I don't want this gentleman at my table. <laughs> JJ, I need you in for two minutes. Mac. Yes? I don't want this man at my table. Sweet Small Success might be an essential classic, but our next movie is without question one of the most beloved movies ever made. And after a quick trip down to Little Italy, we found ourselves at one of the essential locations from Francis Ford Coppola's epic saga, The Godfather. All right, so we don't want to get, <laughs> we don't want to get thrown out of here, but this is from The Godfather. This is where it all goes down. It's where Michael actually becomes The Godfather. Yeah, I have to admit that I think Gordon Wallace does a better job of lighting this place than the actual people who run this place. Godfather, 1972. It is probably safe to say the great American saga in movies. I don't know if anything else comes, comes close in terms of being the movie equivalent of the great American novel, but what I love most about it is the kind of movie that Hollywood is no longer has the skill set to make where you have a crowd-pleasing blockbuster and a masterpiece of cinema all in one. And there's probably no scene that better signifies Michael's transformation into The Godfather than a scene shot right inside here, exterior shot in Staten Island, but Michael becomes godfather to Connie's only child, or first child, who's actually baby Sophia Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola's daughter. And you, well, I think you know more about this than I do, but the cross-cutting between Michael renouncing Satan as he starts taking out the members, the heads of the five family, but I don't, I don't know, I mean, for me, that's kind of the, the emotional peak of the movie. Think of what came beforehand. You know, you have Rando, you have uh, uh, Jimmy Can, you have uh, Duvall, you have all these people, these incredible scenes, and then it's like, and yet it's editing. It's, it makes this something else. The whole movie is transcended, from horse heads to all this other stuff. Johnny Fontaine, but then the simple act of cross-cutting is like going back to basic film art to create the most transcendent scene in the film. That's what's amazing. And also, I mean, it's, we're near Little Italy. This is kind of ground zero for a lot of New York film culture yeah. because Marty Scorsese himself grew up one block over that away. 
If you're a film freak, you can't visit Little Italy without paying tribute to one of our greatest filmmakers, Martin Scorsese, who in 2019 is still active with a vengeance with his new movie, The Irishman. But before he embarked on his legendary career with films like Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, The Last Waltz, Raging Bull, King of Comedy, After Hours, Color of Money, Goodfellas, Martin Scorsese, he lived right here with his parents on Elizabeth Street, where he was rapidly falling completely in love with the world of cinema. When Scorsese was a little boy, show called Million Dollar Movie, where they played the same movie for a week. And he loved that show, but one week, the show Citizen Kane. And so at the end of that week, his journey, according to him, for becoming a filmmaker, had officially gotten uh, underway. Baseball games coming in out yeah. of windows. Watching westerns on TV, eating his mother's pasta. Yeah. Sure, it was fun. See, one dog's doing this way, the other dog's going that way. Yeah, he's like, what do you want from me? <laughs> One dog goes one way and the other dog goes the other way. Why one not? is going east and the other one is going west. So what? And this guy's saying, what do you want from me? You don't think it's too subtle. And now for one of the most recognizable buildings in the city, Firehouse Hook and Ladder Company 8 in Tribeca. It can be said about Ghostbusters that has not already been said, but it's one of the first movies I can remember as a kid where I was both aware of New York as a character in the movie because it is a quintessential New York movie, but also just suddenly appreciating and enjoying this giant pop culture phenomenon. Like I'd been, I'd seen hit movies, but none where suddenly the soundtrack is everywhere. People are talking about the movie at school. People are talking about the actors. It was just, it was the first time I saw a blockbuster, but it's a weird thing where it's like, is it a comedy pretending to be a sci-fi supernatural like horror movie? Or is it a big blockbuster sci-fi flick pretending to be a comedy? It's a weird hybrid, and they don't really make movies like that anymore. Yeah, it's kind of the first of its kind, I think, right? I mean, you talking about it had sci-fi elements, uh, and it was a big budget thing, but at the same time you had these guys who'd started out in comedy movies. It was the Stripes crew essentially coming back. It's not at all like Stripes, it's really its own entity so to speak, uh, with the ghost and all that. It's almost like it's a fluke that it winds up succeeding in spite of itself in, in, this, in, in this incredible fashion. But yeah, the, the firehouse, I think, was a great... I, mean, I, I think this was a firehouse that was in service at the time, but it's the perfect, like, plucky type institution that the Ghostbusters wanted to establish for themselves as a home base. Um, and so that and the mixture of the old ambulance are these old New York, um, you know, signifiers, like the yellow checker cab, for instance. People just knew what they looked like. So to, to take it and employ it in this weird way is a lot of transmogrification of stuff that's just been around forever. I think he just craved a little affection, you know, a sense of being loved and needed and wanted. That's a very interesting point of view. <laughs> Feel the breeze from the subway? Back in Midtown, we bumped into some tourists who clearly love Marilyn Monroe just as much as we do. They were really disappointed to find no statue or anything to mark the spot, apart from a few overly excited film freaks. Isn't it delicious? Few directors define the 50s more than the great Billy Wilder. We talked a lot about gangster movies. We talked a lot about comedies. We haven't really talked about sex yet, and maybe the moment that immortalized the 20th century's greatest sexual icon more than any other was shot right here Marilyn Monroe, Seven Year Itch, director Billy Wilder. is not his best comedy. It's a George Axelrod play, but I think Something Like a Hot is stronger. I think The Apartment is stronger. But when it comes to iconic images, Marilyn Monroe with her dress flying up and over her head saying, isn't it delicious? And that's sex. <laughs> <laughs> there's, no, there's, no, there's no getting around that, but... Uh... Looking at locations, we're always talking about Hollywood flim flam. And it's amazing that this great was where they attempted to shoot it, and they got the wind, and they had a bunch of paparazzi looking at it, and, and this is it. It's a media circus. Thousands of spectators, hundreds of reporters and photographers. It's hot as shit, exactly. And then it turns out that they don't wind up using the footage. They wind up spoofing everything back in Los Angeles on a soundstage. In spite of the fact that the scene was shot in LA, anytime you see a poster, anytime you see a painting, anytime you see a still from that night, it is from the publicity event that they had right here. If you actually watch the scene, it actually is kind of underwhelming. But if you've seen it in pop culture anywhere, in a restaurant or a hotel, whatever, it is from New York City, Marilyn Monroe doing her thing. And that's when she strikes all the various poses, when it's blowing all around her. That's what's famous. It's actually far more famous than the, like, the movie itself. So we all would love to have a moment like that from the seven-year age. So not Billy Wilder's finest, but 
Billy Wilder was here in New York. So whether you're talking about Sergio Leone, Martin Scorsese, I just love the idea of these great, giant, towering, just monoliths of cinema's and art form here in our fair city making kick-ass flicks. And it just makes me happy that he was here. Who's going to do the pose? You or I? Uh, you is, it. Isn't it delicious? Isn't it delicious? For the last stop on our journey, we returned to my neighborhood, Greenwich Village, to celebrate yet another director whose movies got me obsessed with film in the first place. Of all the admirers of Alfred Hitchcock, the greatest of his disciples has to be Brian De Palma, the visionary filmmaker behind Hi Mom, Phantom of the Paradise, Carrie, Dressed to Kill, Blowout, Scarface, Body Double, The Untouchables, and depending upon my mood, perhaps my favorite of them all, Carlito's Way. Nineteen ninety-three, Carlita's Way, a movie from yet another one of the all-time great directors, Brian De Palma. We can debate what his best period was and what his best movies were, but I think we can all agree that Carlita's Way is his last great one of his great movies. But for me, it's got an enormous sentimental affection. But before I became movie nerd, cinephile, film history nut, whatever you want to call it, when I was first getting into movies in college, Carlita's Way was one of the gateway drugs. I went to college in 1995. By the time I arrived. Everybody's talking about this, Scarface, Godfather, et cetera. So we would watch Carlita's Way, Scarface, Godfather 1 and 2, Goodfellas, just on a loop over and over and over again. So it's hard to put into words just how much of um, an important role this movie played in just my developing obsession as a just movie nut. Interesting. I hadn't actually seen this movie until like the last three years. It was one of those holes in my repertoire, and I'm a big De Palma guy. I really enjoy his work. But for some reason, when this came out, I just somehow missed it. Which is odd because I saw the imagery and it looked like it was uh, the hairstyles, the clothes, it was like really conjuring the day and age in which it was built. Um, and it seemed like a really great story for De Palma to tell. After having finally seen it, it's like Sean Penn is amazing in this film. Best role I, mean, I ever had. Well, there's just, there's a level of debauchery and patheticness that's like that Sean Penn is capable of being vulnerable, which he is, is actually really good. Some actors can't play vulnerable, and yet if you look at the best things and that- untrustworthy and yeah. despicable. Yeah. It's, it's, it's Wee, so, it's just the slime. So many bad qualities. That's awesome, and it's like, uh, the fact is that, that you know, Carlito uh, Briganti is kind of such a morally steadfast character. He's really resolute, he takes care of his friends, he's got this, this arch backbone, I mean, this, this sort of um, real spinal strength throughout the entire movie. You know, like, what takes him down? But what I also love about this is that as great of a gangster movie as it is, and it's one of the great gangster movies, it's also this incredibly moving love story which starts right here. Charlie standing yeah. here, Gail coming out down there. He follows her down to the ballet studio. Camera pans up, he's standing there with the trash, trash can lid in the rain. And you're here in the flower duet, which was from like 1890, 1895. And it's just this stunningly beautiful, just haunting, melancholy, the scene of like unrequited love or like lost love and it's like do we get second chances in life do we get second chances in love most gangster movies don't go anywhere near that territory but De Palma completely totally sells you and also De Palma lives in this neighborhood I've never seen him around but this is his neighborhood so tons of scenes from Carlito's way are shot in and around this neighborhood to double my sentimental affection for the movie I live at 11th and 6th, which is one block north of the ballet studio. So not only is it one of my quintessential movies, that I'm part of my life now, because every time I walk down the street, I'm reminded of Carlito's Way. So I hope you enjoyed sharing in our little adventure zigzagging around New York. There are so many other films to get to, from King Kong all the way up to The Avengers. I've already got the itch to work on the sequel. But before I wrap up, I want to offer a special thanks to my fellow adventurer, filmmaker Bill Scurry. He's the host of the I Don't Get It podcast. And I also want to thank my good friend Bill Tech, who directed this video. If you've enjoyed our show, please remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. There's going to be a hell of a lot more content coming your way in the near future. But thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. But more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards. Keep going. Keep telling me. Don't look at the camera. Don't look at the camera. Just go by like you're fighting. Like you're fighting. Don't look at the camera. It's for television. Just go through. Go through. Just go by. Keep going.